<clears throat> so this session we'll do meditation and um, some Q&A at the end. There was one question in the chat, so maybe we can just uh, tidy that up before we start. Um, Pia was asking, I'm wondering how the self-punishing mind that I'm not good enough is self-cherishing? It, it's a really good question, Pia, and um, it's, it's a little bit delicate because the self-cherishing mind can think you're the best, but it can also think you're the worst. You know, it can think I'm not good enough or I'm so amazing or I'm so misunderstood or why don't people think I'm amazing or maybe I'm awful. It centralizes, you know, the self-cherishing thought places you in the center of the universe and it could be a happy center or an unhappy center an amazing or a horrible, but you're central. And because of that, it's like too much pressure. Yeah. And then, you know, our mind is so strong and expansive and able and putting all of that incredibly powerful focus on one person kind of makes us implode a little bit. And so self-cherishing can do things like say, I have permission not to work for the welfare of sentient beings because I am thinking I am bad. <laughs> You know, it does these kind of strange negotiations, a little bit like guilt, right? And remember in Tibetan, there is no word for guilt. You know, that kind of says, um, if I feel bad about it, then I don't have to do it. <laughs> the, pay, the price I pay for not doing the good thing is to whip myself. So I'll just whip myself and then it's okay, I'm off the hook. You know, or, um, you know, like I talked about last time of, you know, when we don't, take care of ourselves it seems like it's not self-cherishing but actually when you don't take care of yourself then the best of you isn't accessible to others you know so so it's kind of like oh I'm only hurting myself by you know smoking too much or whatever I'm only hurting myself but you're diminishing your own capacity to be of benefit to others so it is self-cherishing even though it's self-punishing does it make sense so cherish is a weird word, you know, it's a weird word, but to say self-cherishing in Buddhism really just means excessive self-focus at the expense of others, with indifference to others, not noticing your impact on others. And it is why we feel so isolated and alone and alienated and grumpy and misunderstood and disrespected and fragile. You know, it's like, we think, oh, people don't understand me. That's why I feel misunderstood. No, self-cherishing is making you notice those things that reinforce that worldview. Do you know what I mean? So it's all attitude shift. <laughs> it's all attitude shift and gentle and with space. And when we do this meditation, when you do it, you know, I might be saying things that are totally easy that you're already at peace with. And I might say things that are way beyond your capacity and you're not ready for yet. So see each statement as kind of an invitation and make it your own at your own level today. So just kind of use it as a, like a pivot point or a launch pad or something like that. So each, each thing that I say is an invitation. Don't feel like you need to force yourself into thinking it. Just use the steps at the you know, capacity you're able to. Okay, so we'll just take a minute and get a good straight posture as best as you can without any kind of physical pain. And if you can be unsupported without leaning against the chair or the wall, that's ideal. So just shift around a bit until you feel like you can be maintaining your own posture without any kind of strain or stress. The main thing being a straight back. And if you need cushions to wedge yourself or to prop under your knees, or if you're in a lot of physical pain, it's okay to lay down. But just feel very solidly present in your body. And if it helps you minimize distraction, go ahead and close your eyes or just leave them a tiny bit open to allow light in. and come back to your motivation. 
thinking the purpose of my life is to bring happiness and to dispel suffering. And I need to understand how to do that within myself in order to help other people do it for themselves. May this practice deepen my self-awareness and expand my abilities all the way to enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can frame that motivation in your own words, but try and keep the heart of altruism. Let it sink in. And then allowing surface distractions to settle, shift your focus to the breath. And try to just be with the breath without any other agenda. watching without judgment. We're listening without coming to any conclusions. Spacious, not spacey. Relaxed, but not vague. See if awareness of the breath can gently bring you to that place where you're no longer interested in your own distractions. And then shift to analysis and start with the first point, which is to equalize self and others. And first consider the very basic truth that all sentient beings want happiness, don't want suffering, just like myself even if their behaviors and strategies for achieving these is very different, the underlying motivation of trying to establish comfort and peace of mind is the same. Try to feel the sameness and have some affinity with others, even though we're so diverse in our expression of it. At the core of our motivation, the drive is the same. 
just wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. Skillful choices, unskillful choices, all flowing from that. And notice if you find any insight, truth of that statement, or if you find any resistance to that statement where you're not sure if that is true or not. Allow yourself to explore the corners of that premise that the drives of myself and all sentient beings are the same, even if their expressions are quite different. Try to think of instances of how that is true, or if you're not sure if that's true, just explore. And see if you can rest in that conclusion that whether I agree or disagree with the methods, whether I understand, it does seem quite true that underlying every choice is that wish for happiness and contentment or avoidance of suffering and pain. And in this way, all sentient beings are equal and the same And then very gently, with great self-awareness, try to ask yourself, how much of a day or how much of a life do I spend focused on the needs of myself, this one individual, as opposed to considering the needs and welfare of all sentient beings? Or even almonds or even my family. Just try and make a very gentle and kind assessment that is very honest. How much time do I spend focused on myself? Not with altruism. When I get up in the morning, do I think self or self and others? Do I think just getting through today? Or do I think how will this go towards my whole spiritual path? Short view or long view? 
self-centered or self-aware. Just checking in with most mornings. How am I? And as the day progresses, do I gain mindfulness of the spiritual path or do I lose mindfulness of the spiritual path? Or am I able to maintain some continuity for a few hours? Can I identify peak areas in the day where I'm very aware of altruism and the spiritual path or prominent areas in the day where I definitely get distracted and lose mindfulness. Towards the evening, do things get better or worse in terms of awareness of the spiritual path, in terms of altruistic intention? Or does my world get smaller and more centralized? Do I feel released from the stress of the day back into my path? Or is during the day my path and at night, I centralize back into myself and get self-absorbed. Or neither. Just knowing. And see if you can genuinely land on the conclusion that a day with a higher percentage of focusing on the long view and the big picture and all sentient beings, including oneself, is a more enriching day, a deeper day with more satisfaction and contentment than the days we spend self-obsessed absorbed to see if you can experientially touch that fact using memory using logic And then shift to thinking about what are the disadvantages of self-cherishing for myself or related to myself, both in my own experience and the impact I have on other people, both. When I have this negative self-obsession that becomes irritable or needy, What happens to me? What do I do to others? And again, with great kindness and great gentleness towards yourself, make an honest assessment.
And how does it feel when others direct their self-cherishing toward you? What's the impact on you as an individual? What's the impact on the atmosphere around that person? So just switch and think about the disadvantages of self-cherishing and others. The way in which it prevents us seeing the best in them. The way their self-cherishing clouds their judgment, blocks their heart, influences negative choices. and drive all blames into one, banish the one to blame for everything. This self-centered attitude, the self-cherishing thought. It hurts me, it hurts others. I hurt me, I hurt others under its influence. And then shift to thinking about the advantages of cherishing others. First, thinking about yourself on those days when your heart is open, when you're working for the welfare of others without attachment, without pressure and expectations, without being goal-oriented, when you're just openly altruistic, unconditional goodwill, those moments in time, how do you feel as an individual? Do you feel more relaxed physically? Are your words more kind? Is your mind more at ease? Or not, then consider why. What is the benefit to others when you are motivated by cherishing others? What aspect of you do they receive? What experience of you might they have? What is your influence on the atmosphere and mood and tone of the people around you? What is it like to be on the receiving end of cherishing others, of bodhicitta, of someone else's kindness and compassion? How does it feel to be considered, to be respected and uplifted? 
to be accepted, to feel safe. For there to be no competition or judgment. What is it like to be around someone motivated in that way? You can think of historical figures or spiritual and religious leaders or regular people within your own life who have offered you this at various times. But try to touch what it's like. And then what is it like globally? What is it like nationally? What is it like within a workplace or a family? When the underlying current is people's cherishing of others. When there is expansiveness, intersectionalism, global awareness. If universal altruism is at the core of choices, what positive change occurs? Maybe there's been times when the tone of a group you were in all synchronized and everyone was altruistically motivated, at least for a moment. Maybe a point in history where people made a decision for the greater good. But see if you can land on that advantage of living with cherishing others, as opposed to self-cherishing. And then see if you can decide genuinely on purpose to exchange your own self-cherishing for cherishing others. If being motivated by bodhicitta is truly the way you want to live your life, even if it's imperfectly practiced and still growing, just see, does it feel like an authentic way to motivate your life? Is it what you want? See if the choice arises or the decision arises without anything forced around it. almost as if you're allowing that intention to arise because of having overcome the habit of self-cherishing. And then having decided to exchange self-cherishing for cherishing others, actually do it in practice, in real time, riding on your very breath, 
to whatever capacity you feel able to, starting with yourself, breathing in suffering, giving it to the self-cherishing thought, breathing out happiness, well-being, roots of virtue, etc., letting go of your attachment to them. Breathing in black smoke, breathing out golden light, Gradually expanding to people in your life, to areas of the world, and see if you can gradually include every single sentient being. We'll do this for five minutes and just see how much you can stretch your radius of compassion, loving kindness, and bodhicitta. Taking on the in breath, giving on the out breath. And just stay with that visualization in black smoke, out golden light. Staying with that mentality, breathing in, connect with compassion, breathing out, connect with loving kindness. Gradually expanding. And think that with each round of breath, of taking in suffering, of giving out happiness, that hard shell of self-cherishing dissolves more and more, your heart expanding more and more, freed from the cage, self-cherishing built around it.
allowing self-cherishing tendencies to dissolve, that part that pushes away and fears suffering, that part that hoards happiness and clings to it. Each breath allowing the heart to expand. And then with the next few breaths, feel that that shell is completely dissolved. The heart is finally released. And all sentient beings and all environments dissolve into light. And all of that light then absorbs into you together with a sense of connection and responsibility. And then think through the strength of these thoughts, through the power of this merit, May we all become enlightened in order to benefit all sentient beings. Okay, you can relax your attention. Do you guys have um, any immediate impressions or questions? So each one of those five points could be its own meditation, its own analytical meditation. You could just explore equalizing or just explore disadvantages or advantages or the conclusion or just do Tonglen. Um, if you did any of them on their own, it's, it's good to do the rest of them, at least in an abbreviated way, so you don't mix, miss the broader context. But um, how's it going? Do you think you could lead yourself through that if you wanted to? Yeah, go ahead, Scott. I think I, I would probably need a little guidance another time or two. So I'm going to, I think maybe I can get that off of the recording of this. But um, Yeah, yeah. And there's those, um, the email that Lee sent um, when we had to uh, postpone last Wednesday because of my power outage. Um, there's some guided meditations um, in that links as well, if you prefer. Um, are are yeah. they, are they, um, uh, is, it, is it printed something that we read <clears throat> or is it, linked like a YouTube or something. Yeah, one is a YouTube and one is an internet archive, just straight audio. Yeah, yeah, or this one, if you like this one, um, it's all of a piece. And of course there's, you know, shorter versions and longer versions and other teachers leading it. So you might find the way that gels for you. It's good to kind of cross fertilize. And then at some point you become so familiar with it that you can walk yourself through it without kind of getting lost. Um, but just, you know, really gently and, if it feels like you like these ideas, but it's a bit too confronting to meditate on them by yourself, sit with them as like a journal exercise or a reflective discussion with yourself or with a friend and just kind of like unpack each of the five steps and just kind of explore in that way. Because remember that wisdom is developed through hearing, contemplating and meditating. So if it feels too soon for the meditating, just go back a step and just do some good reflecting on those. The, the other side of Lo Zhang is, um, you know, going more into ultimate bodhicitta, which relies a bit more on an understanding of Buddhist philosophy, in particular, um, understanding of the middle way view. But I think that you can make it simple for yourself if you haven't studied philosophy deeply yet. Um, you can think about context, 
Yeah, if that helps. So what, what you can do when you're feeling yourself hooked by self-cherishing is to unhook yourself by remembering more details of the story. You know, so for example, if you're in a conflict with someone, you do the very basic thing of, I am very upset right now. Would I be exactly as upset as I am right now if I had slept better? <laughs> if I was the right temperature, if my blood sugar wasn't low, if I hadn't had a stressful week, if I hadn't had an ongoing conflict with other people today or et cetera, et cetera, would my reaction be the same? Um, or switch to think, would they have said that in exactly that way if they were happy? <laughs> Is it usually happy people that cause trouble? No, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so you're just kind of doing basic, basic reflection about context and that can start bringing the vibe of understanding ultimate bodhicitta, even before you have an understanding of the emptiness of inherent existence. You can look at dependent arising in a very surface level of just looking at context. You know, this is only a big deal because my life is small right now, for example, you know, like we're stuck at home maybe because of the pandemic or sheltering in at home or uh, protecting each other by being at home or however you want to frame it. But you could think, okay, whatever drama is happening in my life, does it feel bigger than it normally would because I'm going out less? and I'm having less external stimuli, you know, things like that. So, you know, this is only big because I have this small life or this is only small because my life is bigger or, you know, and just kind of, again, that flexibility of mind that can consider things from many angles. Um, this can be really useful in starting to bring in the vibe of ultimate bodhicitta. Um, there's a verse about ultimate bodhicitta I really like. So I'll, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, the main practice, number two, training in bodhicitta, this in the seven point mind training has two sections, the relative one and the ultimate one. But under the ultimate one, it has a few just kind of invitations to start touching ultimate bodhicitta, at least in a kind of basic way. And the first is to consider all phenomena as like dreams. And you don't want to do this in a dissociative way where you're completely disconnected from what's happening with life and completely disengaged. You want to do this in a way that has detachment, that realizes how dramatic things are isn't actually how dramatic things are. It's my perception of them. So if it was a dream, things in dreams can appear incredibly dramatic and significant, and there can be great tragedies and great adventures and all sorts of things can unfold in a dream. And then you wake up and you realize it was just a dream and its significance just very naturally shrinks. And it might still be something interesting that happened, something interesting that you reflect on what's going on with me that I had such a dream, but you're not hooked into thinking it's reality. So this is just kind of an interesting one to consider all phenomena as like dreams. Examine the nature of unborn awareness. This can mean a lot of things depending on the commentary you're looking at, but it can be what is true before I have any opinions about it. Or if I didn't bring all my conditioning to this, what's just my bare awareness that is just reflecting without judging or labeling. This can be an interesting way, especially if you're hooked into some sort of like attachment drama or some sort of obsession about something you need this or you can't have that and you're really locked in to ask yourself, how would you observe the same exact scenario if it was from an unconditioned place? If it was the first time anything of this had ever happened and you were bringing no past experiences to it, if you were just observing it, what would it be like? And the other is the remedy itself is released in its own place, which is more like a practice advice, which is what happens when you're very used to catching yourself getting hooked by self-cherishing. If you can be a very attentive observer of your own experience and be watching your own afflictions as they unfold with the mental space that knows that their nature is deceptive, then just as you see your own story unfold, it starts to fall apart and dissolve right in front of you because you know that is not ultimate truth. So 
set the entity of the path on the nature of the basis of all. That one is a longer conversation, maybe for next time. But I want to leave you with this idea, which is in the period after meditation, be a child of illusion. In the period after meditation, be a child of illusion. And that means really to have that not innocent in a naive way, but innocent in a curious way that is not jumping to conclusions about what is what. Does that make sense? That kind of childlike mind that, you know, can pick up a stick and say, this is not a stick, it's a house. You know, it's, it's that kind of curious mind that is not certain, but not in a fearful way, in a curious kind of intrigued way. I wonder what this could be. And it's wondering what this could be from a place of joy, altruism, creativity, and not from a place that says, I need this to give me happiness. It's more kind of inviting the fact that happiness is always accessible. You know, the way in which a happy child can find an adventure in anything. And illusion, you know, again, it's not like there's nothing there when you're seeing an illusion. It's just that things aren't there in the way that they seem. So you're just noticing that everything has this illusory aspect that it appears to inherently exist when in fact it dependently arises. You know, that the very opposite of reality is what's appearing to us, that all conventional truths are deceptive. That's the very nature of a convention is that it's deceptive. And so we have to operate within that world and not, you know, go with it, but at the same time, keep that open openness that is aware there is an ultimate truth so that you don't get hooked by the story. Yeah. So in the period after meditation, you kind of rise up from your seat, holding the things that you touched in your meditation and trying to look at the world with a little bit new eyes and wise eyes that doesn't lose what you touched on your meditation once you stand up. So um, we'll go ahead and do our dedication. And just again, think that all of the energy we put into these thoughts, this has power, this has significance and um, you know, let yourself kind of celebrate that fact. May all beings everywhere plagued by sufferings of body and mind obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then, may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. And then we'll just do some uh, short long life prayers for our teachers. And so if your teacher is not included on this list, just um, think that it is implied. <laughs> the wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, the incomparably kind Supreme Tenzin Gatso, may you have a long life and all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. You who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as a bountiful bearer of all, spreading, preserving, and spreading Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three sublime ones, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. Embodiment the three divine refuges who blesses all, Gendon Tenzin, holder of the teachings, may your life spin last for eternity. May your excellent deeds pervade all of time and space and continuously ripen for the nourishment of myself and others. Okay, thanks everyone. Remembering the emptiness of the three spheres, agent, action, object.
click, click. <laughs> and then I'll see you next time. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you so much, Vanova. This was wonderful. And thank you everyone for coming. We have to see you next time. Thank you.